So hello, everyone. Um, you're all very welcome along to this event. I think this might be the first event uh, of this year's Festival of History. Uh, we are in our 11th year. It is the largest program uh, we've yet put together. We got to 200 events uh, in the end, and they are right across the city of Dublin. Uh, there are events happening in civic buildings like the Mansion House, City Hall, uh, in museums like 14 Henrietta Street and Richmond Barracks, and in your local library. Really, it's the local libraries uh, that drive this festival. And we're so grateful to librarians and library staff all over the city uh, who've, who've opened their doors for the festival. This year, we've programmed a number of events uh, on Zoom as well, which, of course, is nice for a number of reasons. One, it, it, it often allows a kind of international crowd uh, to come along. And if there's anyone tuning in uh, from, from far and distant lands, it'd be great to hear from you in the uh, Q&A. We've programmed two talks, really, kind of at the very beginning of this festival, focused on the history uh, of emergency services in the city. Tomorrow, we have a talk on Dublin Fire Brigade and a new series of commemorative plaques that are being put up across the city, uh, marking locations where, where firefighters lost their lives. And today we have this great talk from Garda Stephen Moore on just a really well-received book nominated for an Irish Book Award. It was many things. It was an illustrated history. It was an oral history. The story of the 100 years of on Garda Siakana. Uh, Garda Stephen Moore has published on the history of two Garda stations, two fascinating Garda stations, architecturally and otherwise, Kevin Street uh, and Pierce Street. And yeah, originally this idea, Finbar, uh, the librarian in uh, Marino Library, his father was in the Garda, uh, was very keen that we that we get this subject into the festival. I love this book. It was one of my favourite books of last year. So it's a real honour to have uh, Stephen with us. So any questions, please do put them in the Q&A box and... Uh, we'll get to them uh, at the end. It'll be time for a bit of chat, I hope. For now, it's over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Donald, and, and thank you for that that that, that welcome. Uh, and welcome, everybody, to this evening's chat. Uh, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Stephen Moore. I'm a guard based in Pier Street Garda Station. I joined on Garda Street Con in 2003. And it was whilst I was working in, in Pier Street, I was seconded to the Garda Museum in Dublin Castle. And in the museum, it used to be the, the last remaining records uh, building in the castle or the last remaining tower where the, where the Garda Museum used to be. And whilst working there, I, I was able to discover, I rediscover my love of history. And I also discovered that the station where I was based, Pier Street, was coming up to celebrate a centenary in uh, 2015. So I, I kind of got to thinking what we could do for it. And I approached my superintendent then, Joseph Gannon, and I asked Superintendent Gannon, would he like to produce a book for our centenary? So that was my first, uh, I suppose, jump in, into, into the, the idea of, of history books. And we created Pier Street 100, which was a centenary celebration of Pier Street Garda Station. I thoroughly enjoyed working on the book and, and putting the book together. And it really, it gave me the grow for, for history and gave me the grow to pursue further history projects. Uh, it wasn't long when, when Chemistry Garda Station came calling and it was when they moved into their new purpose-built building uh, on, on Kevin Street that they asked me to do a book to celebrate that fact and to celebrate the old station uh, in Kevin Street, which is such a historic building uh, that, I, again, I jumped at the opportunity and, and, and really, you know, loved my, my time working in the Liberties and, and working on the history of, of Kevin Street Garda Station. So, so then they say three three things that are char a charm or are, are things come in, in, in threes. I suggested a book for the, the centenary celebrations of Angarda Street Connor. And the the work on the book kind of started, it was pre-COVID when, when I met Michael O'Brien for the first time and, and the idea of the book kind of came to fruition. And we kind of sat down with the idea of 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 doing the book, I then approached Garda management and and asked them basically, is it something that they they would have wanted to run with for their their idea of the centenary uh, celebrations? And thankfully, they came back and and they said it was. 
So working kind of hand in hand with Michael, uh, who has since passed on, we kind of very quickly uh, developed a relationship and it was a pleasure working with Michael O'Brien, everybody in the O'Brien press, his son Ivan. And it, it was thanks to them that, that the book, uh, you know, was launched in, in September uh, 2022 to coincide with the 100 year anniversary of Angarda Sri Khanna. Uh, the, the, book, the book itself, as I said, the concept of it was... I suppose it was it was in my mind whilst I was working on the Kevin Street book, if I was honest. And it was always something I wanted to do uh, was the book for the 100 year anniversary. And I was delighted because, uh, again, you know, management could have gone with an academic. And first and foremost, I, I, I am not an academic. I never claimed to be. Uh, you know, I'm a, a kind of hobby historian. So I, you know, people like Donald amaze me with the work that they do, and and other historians who are part of this festival of history. I'm kind of a a bit of a codger, uh, jumping onto the bandwagon. But how I describe myself probably is a facilitator of the history. So with all my books, it's it's about meeting the people who lived through the history, meeting the guards who were involved in, you know, the the significantly historic. Uh, periods in in Irish history, because for me on Garda Síochána, when you talk on on uh, modern Irish history or you talk about you know the, the formation of the Free State, you know one of the very first things that the, the 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 new country or the new established country did was form a police force back then. Now, today we call it a police service, but back then it was, it was a police force, and that was the, that that was the the start and, and the formation of Angarda Síochána. So with the book, and as, as Donald said, again, so fortunate that the, that the book was was shortlisted for an award last year. And, and, and again, just delighted that it was. And it kind of goes to show that, you know, in Ireland, we're such a small country that everybody has a connection in some form or way with a member of Angarda Síochána. And it might be your neighbor. It might be somebody you play football with. It might be somebody in your family. But the connection in, in a small community, which Ireland is, you know, there's not many people that does not have that connection with, with somebody uh, in Angarda Síochána. And it's kind of the ethos of, you know, my strong beliefs in, in, in Angarda Síochána. It's that community spirit. And talking to... to police officers from different countries you know around the world we're very fortunate in this country that we are such a community based uh, police uh, service and that you know we we play sport in our communities we get involved in in our communities and I'll, I'll, I'll explain why uh, shortly you know that this is something that was ingrained to members um, of a fledgling uh, police force when we were established so the book, the book that, that that I wrote was called The Guardians. And as I said, it was 100 years of Magarda Sheikhana. Like with, with history and like with the book, I kind of kept it as chronological as possible. And we, we, we split the book into, into three sections. So we had the first generation, we had the second generation, and then we moved on to, to modern policing. So I'm just going to kind of take you through kind of chapter, chapter, and you know, speak a little bit on each chapter and how they came about, how it was formulated. Uh, and as I said, I'm going to keep it as chronologically as uh, chronological as possible as, as, as we move on. The, the front cover of the book, uh, we decided to go with a picture of a, a community guard and, and for the launch. And when we launched the book, it was in fin Fingless Garda Station, September 2022. And we were able to make contact with the the, the guard who was on the front cover back then, I, the photograph I think it was 19, 1981 and the guard's name was is Michael O'Leary and it was great to meet Michael and you know he was he was so pleased to be on the cover uh, of the book and it kind of illustrates the role of Angarda Sri Khan, it's you know a gentleman talking to, to people of the community and again really that is you know the role I see uh Member, members of the Angarda Sri Khanna uh, performing. So after the forwards of, of the book and, and from the commissioner, from Taoiseach Michal Martin and from our minister, Helen McEntee, 
we have the preface, which was written by um, retired Deputy Commissioner John Toomey. So with the idea of the book, the the management of Garda should kind of, kind of put people around me to kind of guide me or to, to kind of steer, I, I suppose, the direction of the book or um, the editorial content of, of the book. And we worked very, very closely together. So they, they kind of formed an editorial board around me. And that consisted of former Deputy Commissioner John, John Toomey, uh, Garda historian John Reynolds, and Director of Communications uh, Andrew McLinden. And again, we worked very, very closely. I won't say we didn't have disagreements every now and again, but we, we had such a relationship that our disagreements could be easily uh, you know, arranged through, erased through communication. And I thoroughly enjoyed working with them on, on this project. So we decided, I suppose, after we, after the idea of splitting the book into three uh, sections with the first generation, second generation and modern policing, uh, I kind of wanted to open the book with, I suppose, the significant events for Angara Shikana over the course of the centenary. Now, there was no way every, every event, you know, would feature. It's, it's, or there's no way that, as I say, every guard who served could possibly feature in, in, in a book of this type. But we tried to cover as, as much as possible. And, and we, we, we tried to, I suppose, with the significant events, kind of portray how Ungarda Shikana has kind of walked hand in hand with, with the country through, through those 100 years and how Ungarda Shikana has always been there, you know, trying to preserve the peace, trying to protect the, uh, the, our natives. So the significant uh, events, and again, it's thanks to uh, Garda Tom Daly who kind of worked very hard on the events. It was probably one of the hardest pieces of the book because there was a lot of debate into exactly what should, what shouldn't. Everybody agreed on probably 95% of, of what should have gone in. And then there was probably... Uh, you know, different opinions on 5% of, of kind of what went in. But again, true conversation and, and the final result, I think, is a very good um, outside picture of Ungar Shikana in 100 years and detailing the significant events, as I said, that, that happened uh, and that Ungar Shikana was obviously involved in. And that, as I said, kind of brings us straight up to when, when the book was produced, you know, 2022. And... Uh, you know the last piece, the last two items that are in the significant events will probably go down as as being two of the most uh, two of the most significant events, which would have been the COVID nineteen pandemic in in twenty twenty and in twenty twenty two. Just the last entry was Garda Shikana in conjunction with international partners undertakes wide reaching transnational operation against the Kinahan organized crime group. So again. That's the type of event over the course of 100 years that are detailed uh, at the start of the book. And it gives people an idea of, of the work, you know, Ungarda Shikana is involved in. Assistant Commissioner John O'Driscoll was due to, to retire. And I knew John had that family connection with Michael Collins. And I really loved the reflection that, that he provided with uh, me with for, for the start of the book. And it just brings into... In, into focus again that that connection with with the start of a new country the historical significance of michael collins and then 100 years later that that connection is there with with, with our retired uh, assistant commissioner uh, john o'driscoll and a very poignant picture of him looking out at the the guards practicing for the for the, the 100 year um commemoration event so again i was delighted that that John agreed to do that for me. And I think it really gives a nice, uh, you know, introduction in, 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 into the book. The first generation, so the section kind of kind of starts, uh, the section part of the book starts at this stage. And we start with the first generation. I kind of give, you know, you can't talk about Ungar Shikana without talking about the police forces that went before. I did not want to dwell on the DMP or the RIC. There's so many fantastic historians out there that, that have dealt with them and, and have dealt with them a lot better than I, I ever could. But, you know, it would have been a miss not to mention them. Um, 
So we kind of, you know, st- I kind of wrote a piece uh, again with, with 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 Tom Daly in in relation to the origins of policing in Ireland, and you know the 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 grandfather of policing, Robert Peel, w- would be mentioned in it, and and also obviously the two acts from from eighteen thirty six, the Constabulary of Ireland Act, uh, which which created and, and set up the Irish Constabulary, which later became the Royal Irish Constabulary after a Fenian rebellion in uh, 1867 what, what was quashed and they, they got the accolade of the royal. And also uh, in the 1836, the other acts have formed the Dublin Metropolitan Police. So Ireland at that stage would have had the two police forces, the RIC, who would have been armed, and the Dublin Metropolitan Police who were unarmed and, and who were based in, in, in Dublin. It was in 1838 that the DMP first paraded in, in their new uniform, very akin to, to the Peters over in London, and 800 men uh, dressed in, in in their navy blue top hats and, and their frock coats would have, could have been seen marching in Dublin. So that was, I suppose, there was other un, um, uncentralised police forces before then, all the way back to the watchmen, but if you're talking about the first kind of regularized, centralized police forces in Ireland, you know, 1836 is a good place to start. The, DM, the creation of the DMP, the creation of the RIC. But as I said, in this book, I didn't want to dwell on that. But we, I gave it a mention just to see where the, the, the history of policing in Ireland came and then up until the creation of Angarda Sri Khanna. So for me, and, and you kind of, when you go back in history and because I haven't lived through it and not many people, you, you know, nobody probably now who, who's there have have kind of, you know, lived through it, the, the, the types of the War of Independence, the Civil War. And, and this is kind of at the stage where the creation of a new police force is, is being thought about, it's being arranged. And kind of very quickly after the War of Independence, you know, the, the, the rule of law had to be maintained. And some people would say Ungarn Shikarna was formed too quickly. Not a lot of time was put into it. Uh, you know, it could have been formed better. It was too akin to the old RIC. For me, I kind of view it a little bit differently in, in the way that it had to be done. It had to be done quickly. Uh, it probably wasn't time to be done perfectly but it, it just had to be done uh, and and so the civic guard or on Garda Sheikh Khan w- w- was created uh, so Michael Collins who, who was chairman of the provisional government of Ireland at the time uh, conven- convened a meeting uh, to establish a new police force uh, in Ireland there was a commemoration done it was in the Gresham Hotel on the Collins Street where, where the, the meeting took place uh, with, with people such as David Elegant, Eamon Broy, uh, Michael Staines, uh, who were present, Exo or IC were also present. And it was drafted, the, it was drafted for the formation uh, of, of, the, of the new police force. As I said, uh, in, initially, uh, the police force had two names. It was the Civic Guard, uh, but later, by 1925, it had one name, which was Ungarda Shikana, which is the name it, it, it still remains today. So the first commissioner, as we move along a little bit on it, was was a man from Mayo, from, from Newport and Mayo, was Michael Staines. And Michael Staines was heavily involved in, in the freedom movement for, for Irish independence. He was a a bearer of... of um, he was he was bearer of the stretcher actually of James Connolly uh, after his injuries in, in, in 1916. So his his connection with with the I suppose the fight for Irish freedom kind of you know goes back and he was selected as the first commissioner uh, of 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 the newly formed uh, police force. Now Michael Staines didn't last in the role too long. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit in relation to the Kildare mutiny, w- which took place. But he was also an elected uh, representative of the Dublin City North constituency. So it didn't really align to have 
both roles as commissioner and, and uh, an elected CD. So he, he was replaced and uh, Owen Duffy became the second commissioner of Angarda Shia The Kildare Mutiny took place and again, many a book has been written on the Kildare Mutiny and it goes into a lot more detail. The book I kind of put together, I didn't want to go into too much detail because again, if 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 you're writing pages and pages on one particular subject, if you're trying to do that over a course of a hundred years, all of a sudden you have volumes and not just one book. So we the mention of Kadera Mutiny, it kind of goes into the 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 details, you know, when it happened, who was involved, uh why it happened. You know, <clears throat> for those people who are who are on and I suppose to give you a, a quick synopsis of it, it I always kind of say it was like it was like you were you start a new job. So so ninety seven percent of the the, the first uh, members of Garda Shikana were ex IRA members. A lot of these pe- people had been convinced to join a new police force, a new state, a new country. They were excited. They came from all over the country uh, to join a new police force, and when they look up all their uh, immediate supervisors, superiors and supervisors are ex or IC, or as they would have seen back then, the ex enemy. So it kind of led to a lot of, uh, as you can imagine, un- unhappiness. Uh, the The treatment of the new recruits wasn't the best. There was discipline issues. the The original um, they were originally housed in the RDS, which didn't last long, and they were they were they were asked to move to facilitate a spring show, and then they they moved down to Kildare. Um, so it it's just it's it didn't start off the very best, and it it led to the to the Kildare mutiny. There's the you know you can look into yourself because I I'm not going to do justice in, in relation to Kildare mutiny because it is a, a fascinating and it's fascinating how it came about it's fascinating how it ended when 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 you know the army appeared and it could have led to to conflict but it didn't uh it was very kind of Ireland back then when the, when they kind of it settled and uh, guard, excuse me, <coughs> guard and members were promoted, so more ex RIC were demoted, and there, there, there was kind of peace, uh, peace generated. But again, if, if you don't know much about it, I definitely recommend looking uh, into it. And, it, and it's kind of it's a pivotal kind of historical part of the formation of Angarda Shikana because it happened very soon after, so it was kind of like a, a new police force was set up, and quite quickly, a new police force was nearly ended. Uh, some would say it was ended and it was reformed. Um, but the, but that kind of led to Michael Stain's re- resignation as well. Uh, it, it led to, I suppose, what Stain's would be famous for would be, we were ruled by the will of the people and not by arms. And my own take on it is, and if you read into the Calera Mutiny, there was arms present. Uh, the original civic guards did have up to uh, 400 rifles and I think it was a thousand revolvers that was there. But this was also the time of the civil war. So you you had uh, anti-treaty um, people kind of joining the civic guards to, to kind of influence uh, people to, to kind of, you know, spy influence. And they kind of ended up robbing ammunition, robbing, robbing arms. So there was there was there was a there was a lot going on and there's a lot to it and it's probably I suppose not my role to talk about the Kildare mutiny because other people can do a better job at it but it is important when we talk about the the history of Angarda Shikana that 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 we do you know talk about uh, Angarda Shikana sorry we do talk about the Kildare mutiny so this kind of led to the appointment of the second commissioner of of the guards General Ono Duffy again. Those people who who know their history and the history of Ireland, there's many a book written in relation to General Owner Duffy uh, in Ireland in libraries and in, and in bookshops. In our book, I wanted to concentrate on the positives of of O Duffy, and kind of didn't didn't focus on, you know, what happened in his later lives. Uh, 
as a commissioner and when he became a commissioner quite soon he he was very well loved by by the men uh, of Angara Shikana at that time he instilled a discipline that that had not been instilled originally and he also brought forth the ethos of sports and the ethos of culture very strongly to the fore like if i always think that you know, if I was a guard and, and I joined in 1922 and uh, originally I'm from Dublin, but say I got stationed down in Cork after my training and a Cork, Kerry or, you know, somewhere in the country, I wouldn't have been, uh, I wouldn't have known a lot about, say, back then as a young man. And I went into the middle of a civil war situation, an unarmed guard, young man, not knowing anybody in my surrounds, not not having any anybody to fall back on, anybody for advice, it would not have been an easy role and it would not have been an easy task. Uh, for, for me, anyhow, these brave men, and, and they're extremely brave to go out in conditions like that, uh, to put themselves in those situations. And you must remember that, that back then, again, during the Civil War, a lot of towns, villages up and down the country there was a lot of people with arms and there was a lot of people with arms who did not want to see a member of Ungarda Sri Khanna entering their town, entering their village. Uh, so for me in particular, I, I just see these young men as, as kind of being heroes of, of a new state, heroes of, of a new Ireland. And I, I believe that the reason why they made those sacrifices or the reasons why they pushed ahead with the ideology of it and and the community focus, the community spirit, has a lot got to do with 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 General Owner Duffy uh, at that stage in his career, um, particularly the ethos of sports and and particularly kind of like go out there and and kind of set up, you know, in in your area if there's not Gaelic games, set up a club, set up um, a, com- a a community uh, base where people in the community can come can 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 play sports or can conduct some form of arts. And and that was that was really instilled into the new guards. The first guard who was who was killed on duty uh, was was Henry Phelan. And that was exactly what he was doing. What, what, when he was killed, he was collecting hurls and slitters to set up a new a new team in Callan. So yeah, as as I said, not to, to dwell on it, but for me, uh the bravery that was shown by those uh, original members of Magarda Shikana, I don't know today if we could sh- show that bravery, but back then they did, and it's a credit to them that they did. Just to to, to kind of show uh, how Ono Duffy kind of instilled that discipline, instilled that 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 feeling of that you're actually achieving something, and that what you were doing is is necessary and it's needed. You know, I'm, I'm just going to read a small piece from. Uh, O'Duffery's first public ap- ap- uh, appearance and, and it was just this paragraph always kind of stuck with me and he, he, he kind of said when he was addressing members of Garda Shikana I trust that when you go to your stations you will not let down the civic guard and the people by abandonment of your post at the behest of any armed coward who would think for meeting you to, in, com- in combat on an equal footing far better the grave than this honour. Don't be alarmed at the sound of a shot. You have heard it before and you were not subdued because you had right on your side and good men had only might. So again, I, I love that piece and it kind of shows the leadership of the man uh, back then. So I in the in the book and it was it was John Duffy who was for, a former curator of the Garden Museum who kind of writes a piece later in the book in relation to, to Owner Duffy, in relation to, you know, his childhood, his his involvement in the GAA and, and so forth. Uh, but we decided not to, to, to kind of go into too much detail on his, on his later life. Uh, and we kind of just wanted to concentrate on him as, as a commissioner. Uh, and, you know, later when, I suppose, when, when Fianna Fáil came into power, it, it was kind of the end the end of him but again like with many of these chapters there's there's a lot of great books out there on on, on Duffy. there's a lot of theories and and there's a lot of uh, facts about him that that 
to me, in, in my mind, it amazed me as well, finding out about the individual. So as we move through through the book, and again, we're still in the first generation in the book, uh, I'm very fortunate to, to know personally Anya Broy, and Anya would be the daughter of our third commissioner of Angarnishi Khan, Ned Broy. Uh, we had a ceremony in in Pierce Street uh, a number of years ago, of the to to commemorate again the centenary of when Michael Collins was smuggled in, in into Pierce Street Garda Station. Pierce Street back then was called Great Brunswick Street Police Station, and it it was renamed Pierce Street to commemorate the 1916 uh, rising in the 50th sorry the 50th year in 1965. But it was in Pierce Street Garda Station uh, where where Collins and a colleague of his was were smuggled in by by Ned Broy. For those of you that just watch Hollywood movies and in in Michael Collins, the Neil Jordan movie, it's let's just say it's not one hundred percent historically ac- accurate. Uh, now Anya would go on to say that she gave Neil Jordan permission to to write the script as it wrote as he explained that you know it needed certain um aspects to to work in hollywood and it, and it, it kind of needed a, a fall guy or a good guy being killed so in the movie you see ned broy uh being killed and being killed in dublin castle and you see michael collins being smuggled into dublin castle but in reality it happened in Pier Street, and it, and it happened out the back of Pier Street Station. So in Pier Street, when you came through a back door in Pier Street, it, there was a spiral staircase which led directly up to a records office. Uh, and that's where, where they went. And they went into the records office to find out about the the G the G-men. The G-men were a detective branch that worked out of Great Brunswick Street and, and it was their role to look after the subversives of the day. So they would have been following IRA men and they would have been building intelligence in relation to the, to the IRA. And Michael Collins wanted to find out what the G Division knew about his, his men. It, it kind of led to the formation of the squad, the 12 Apostles. And from the information that was garden. Uh, in in Pier Street, uh, a number of uh, British officials were 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 killed uh, in in Dublin. So historically, it's a very historic part, and you know I created a tour of Pier Street Garda Station as well to commemorate 1916, and uh, even the people I worked with in the station, you know, they weren't aware of the historic uh, value of of the station or you know, the, the, the value in, in Irish terms uh, of, of the station. So meeting Anya and getting to know Anya was one of my big pleasures. She's, she's an amazing lady. And, you know, she kind of received a lot of information when, when, when her, da- her dad was in prison. He wrote a lot of me- me- memoirs. And according to Anya, he, he was always writing and, and putting in the detail of, of, of those days. Excuse me. And then Broy, kind of, as I said, when Fianna Fáil came into power and Ono Duffy uh, left the commissionership, uh, Ned Broy became the third commissioner of Garda Sri Khan. Uh, like uh, Ned was really loved by by the guards. He, uh, he he went on to have some, some career, and I often say that we don't read about Ned Broy in, in school, in history books when you're going through, but we should. He he had an amazing life from, you know, being third commissioner of the guards. He was, I think, uh, commandant of the Irish in, in the Irish Air, Air Corps, and he went on to be head of the Irish uh, Olympic movement. He had a love for sports, and and like O'Duffy, uh, the a, a kind of importance of sports was very early introduced to, to members of Macarthur Shikana. So, you know. There's not many year where where you see an All Ireland winning team without a number of guards on that team hurling football. Uh, you know later on, you had a Henley winning cup uh, rowers from from Pier Street. You had numerous boxers uh, rowers um, competing at Olympics, and that all came from the very start of of 
the you know the formation of the guards and particularly with with O'Duffy and with Broy, it's the importance of sports uh, uh, in in our job. And it was also, you know, it wasn't just to keep the men fit; it was also to kind of to 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 have a community involvement to to kind of you know. If 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 the guard is playing football on the local team, sure he's not that bad of a fella, you know. And 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 that kind of it opened up communities where doors would have been shut in the past. So, uh, you know, it was an extremely uh, brave move, and but it was an extremely good move to to kind of have Ungarda Shikana accepted post Civil War years, and it kind of you know O'Duffy kind of finishes his commissionership with the Eucharistic Congress which occurred in, in Dublin 1932 and again internationally this was a huge event for Ireland it was the first you know big international event to be held in Ireland and uh, first big international event to be policed in Ireland you know and every, everything went well and, and for a lot of outside countries you know they were kind of looking at Ireland as, as a country that's achieved things that had actually finally uh, arrived on the international stage so in, in the book, as I say, I, I kind of went to Anya and I asked Anya for, for memories of, of our father. And, and we, you know, we kind of, we focused a lot on, on what happened in Pier Street. Uh, but as always, always a pleasure dealing with Anya and, and just hearing the, hearing the stories. Kind of with me when I do books, as I said earlier, I, I kind of like to facilitate those stories. I like to talk to the people who were involved. I like to either interview them uh, in person, uh, online, on the telephone, and actually get an appreciation for the time, and you know, kind of getting a, a real insight. You know, uh, history can be written in many forms and many ways, but for me, it's it's the people that lived it, the people that were there. You know, that will definitely give a different insight, and that's what I, I try to achieve with you know throughout the book. Uh, I couldn't get to speak to Ned Broy, but I got to speak to Ned's daughter. You know, who had first-hand experience of 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 her father. Uh, so again, it's a, it's an important part, uh, important part of of the book. Uh, Superintendent Paul Marr, uh, for those who don't know, he he's he's kind of chair of the 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 Gardaí kind of historical society. And myself and Paul go go way back, and you know I'm always intrigued with his love of of history and his knowledge. So I asked Paul to write a chapter in relation to Oriel House. Again, it's a chapter that's dealt with in in, in other books, and it kind of gives it an insight uh, in, in, into the time. And and I don't think Paul holds back, you know, in in, in the chapter. And uh, you know, from the onset of this, and from discussions with with the editorial board. I, I kind of said to them that there's no point in writing our history if we don't cover the bad stages of our history too. And, you know, it was agreed upon that, that, that we would. And, you know, I hope throughout the book, you know, I, it's, it's not maybe written in big bold writing, but I don't think we hid away from, from much in our history. And, you know, the, the occurrences where the uh, incidents happen where, you know, as a member of Gardaí Chicana, I would not be proud of. I hope, throughout the book that people have found that we have dealt with them uh you know in some way so oral house again it's a fa fascinating chapter and paul you know for me is an expert on the subject uh and, and, and he kind of he wrote a nice piece in relation to it uh again another uh former curator of the of the garden museum was was patrick mcgee and i asked patrick to kind of i suppose write a chapter in relation to progress and and goodwill after Eucharistic Congress, uh, with kind of Ned, you know, with Ned Roy being commissioner, and just how you know the guards were were, were kind of perceived, how they developed, uh, and how Ireland was developing at that time as well. I suppose very soon after the Eucharistic Congress in 1932, you, you have the advent of uh, Nazism over in Germany. You have, you know, what we call in Ireland, I suppose, as a neutral country, we call the emergency. And you have the second, the start of the Second World War. For Ireland, you know, uh, being a neutral country, there was there was times where the government, you know, felt that they might be invaded by the Allies, they might be invaded by Germany because of the proximity to, 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 to Britain. And 
they they set up to supplement the Garda the army the army that set up the local security force and the local defense defense force and they also supplemented the on Garda Shikana with the Taka the Taka Shikana. so the Taka Shikana, again did the same jobs wore the same uniform got paid a little bit less money because the coffers were tight and, and you know we're, we're there's a world war going on uh so there wasn't there wasn't a lot of, of of cash going around. Uh, it's quite funny, kind of talking to 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 you know older guards from 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 that time, and the the nickname Taka kind of kind of stuck as 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 a uh, a kind of bad term you might call someone else. You're only a Taka, but uh, again, they did the same jobs, they, they wore the same uniforms, they had the same powers. After the emergency. Um, I, I, ninety. I think only two or three of the Tucker didn't join on Garda Shikana. So the vast majority, they just joined the the, the police forces there on Garda Shikana. Uh, but again, it was worrying times, you know, for, uh, for the nation. Again, in Pierce Street, and one of, one of the bad things sometimes is that as as an organisation back then, we we weren't very good at preserving our history. We're a lot better now. But when Pier Street was redeveloped and there used to be an old uh, uh, basement area in, in the station before it got redeveloped in, in the 90s. But there was a lot of old LSF and LDF uniforms found and a lot of memorabilia from back then. It wasn't preserved. It wasn't kept. It was it was discarded. Uh, and again, hopefully days like, you know, this this day and age, those things don't happen. I wouldn't like them to think that they do happen. Uh, so back then, unfortunately, it was different, and 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 we lost a lot of historical documents uh, due to due to that. So moving on, and as I said, you know, in relation to Pat and and his chapter, you know, again, a man that that, that knows his history and the next curator of the of of the museum. So as we move on, and then we we we're up to nineteen fifty nine, and I kind of talk about a chapter that uh, the start of women in Angarda Shikana. So the the first females that joined Angarda Shikana, there was twelve of them. Again, they were given a nickname, the Twelve Apostles. I think in Irish history, anybody that number 12 were nicknamed the, 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 the 12 Apostles. So previously, I had been very fortunate to interview Eileen Hurley, who was one of the, the, the first 12 uh, women who joined the Garda Shikana. And I also asked my my uh, retired chief at that stage, Lorraine Wheatley, to kind of give her aspects of, of joining the force. Uh, Eileen was... was was fantastic when I when I interviewed her today. Uh, out of the original twelve, there's only two two ladies still still living, and Eileen uh, sadly passed away. I, I think a few few months after I I interviewed her. Uh, but Eileen's story kind of you know from a, she was stationed in Pierce. The first twelve would have would have trained. They brought over a sergeant from Liverpool, Sergeant Preswick, and. She kind of trained the, the ladies in Phoenix Park. Eileen would tell some great stories like more people came to watch them and take photographs of them marching in the front there of, of, of Garda HQ in Phoenix Park then went to see the monkeys in, in Dublin Zoo around that time. So it was obviously big news in Ireland. You know, uh, ladies had joined on Garda She She told me a story of her first day on the beach. And she was in, she was walking on Pier Street. And back then, the the Garda Code, which which is a kind of book of of the rules and regulations of, of being a guard and the do's and don'ts. And you weren't allowed to fraternize uh, on duty or, you know, talk talk to a colleague. But Eileen was walking up up, up Grafton Street and a colleague, uh, George, came over to, to, to say hello and introduce himself. And just then, uh, a member of the press jumped up and took a photograph which appeared in the front of the of the Irish press. Now poor Eileen was called in the next day and she was disciplined because she was caught uh fraternizing on uh chatting away, sorry, on uh on, on the news. And that was the that was the way it was. Discipline was strict. Uh, when I talked to people who used to live in the station, you know 
there was there was no there was no such thing as like alcohol. They they kind of were, were not in the station at that time, the fifties and the sixties. They you know, the, a lot of people would kind of say they played music. You know, they if they finished their shift, and and back then again, you know, you were you were a guard twenty four seven. You lived in the station. If anything was happening in the city, you were woken up and you were put back on duty. So it was before the Conroy Commission, before the 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 changes in 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 rosters and 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 things and it was hard even to get a weekend off, uh, so so times 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 were you know different than they would be today, but in relation in relation sorry to, to I go back to the, the the women in the job so the twelve joined as Eileen would would tell me she was brought in then one time by the sergeant uh, in charge and. The, the, the sergeant said to her in relation to um, getting promoted that you're going to be promoted and we want you to move down to Limerick. Uh, she said, no, I don't know anybody in Limerick. And, and she kind of protested. He said, well, you're going to Limerick or else. So she did go to Limerick. But the idea behind that was when she was promoted, she was sent down and then she trained up uh, six more females down in Limerick. It just happened that Eileen met her partner and her future husband then then in Limerick. And as she would t- tell me as well, there was a magic number if you did get married, which was seven. So if you served seven years in the job, you were entitled to a pension. And for the women, the, the original women who did go on to marry, they all made sure that, that they, uh, they'd served seven years before they, they ended up getting married. So in the job, when I joined in 2003, I suppose the term Bangarda was still being used. And back then, uh, the term Bangarda w- w- was being used. But today, and possibly I'd say for the last 15 years, I, I don't hear the term Bangarda. If you're a guard, it doesn't matter if you're female or male, you're a guard. Uh, and, and, and that's the way it is. In relation, we have the same uniform now. We have the same pay. They wouldn't have had back then. Back in 1959, the ladies would have worked uh, nine to six and they would have lived close by in rented accommodation. Eileen would tell me that you were always on call. And if there was a female prisoner or a child prisoner uh, at any stage in the evening, the car would come and pick you up to search that 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 prisoner. Uh, but but over time and as society changed, you, the, the, guard, the, the guards changed. And thankfully, kind of culminated in our first female guard commissioner, Noreen O'Sullivan. So so today it's very much a a equal opportunities job uh, in relation to, to women and men. And in every area of 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 the job, you, you would have uh, you, you would have the mixed sexes. Uh, there was a book that we did last year to commem- commemorate women in the job. It's it's women in Angola Shikana, and and it kind of highlights, uh, uh, you know, the the pioneers, the, the the first twelve, but also the pioneers of first females that drove a car, first females that, you know, became sergeant, that became uh, inspector, superintendent, and so forth. And and it was a pleasure being part of the, of, of of that project also. Uh, so kind of moving on, and we, we kind of, there's a piece on Lugs Brannigan. I, I won't kind of go into that. Uh, you know, there's other books, again, in like Bernard Neary's books, Lugs is, is, is fantastic. But we had to give Lugs a mention because I suppose any Irish person, if you mention on Garda Shikana, Lugs comes into the conversation at, at some point. Just to say that if Lugs was in the job today, he'd probably last a week and and, and, and then he'd be fired. But, you know, the, the back then, you know, he he built up a, a, a reputation, and and that's why we had to put him in the in, in the book. We couldn't leave our brothers out from Cork, and a fantastic historian and retired member Tim Bow uh, came in and did a lot of research in relation to the peace in Cork, in relation to the very foundation of the Garda Shikana in Cork, and featuring some of the major incidents that that happened, you know, through the years in Cork. Uh, and then we, we, we kind of were coming up and the second part of the book, then you'd have the, the, the second generation. Second generation in, in the book is, is kind of talking a lot in relation to the original members had retired and they had to bring up the numbers of a Garda Shea Connor again. There was a big push for recruitment there. But society had changed and people in society were better educated than they used to be. And guards were no longer going to were going, no longer going to accept the terms and conditions 
of of guards that had previously you know guards wanted the right to vote you know way back when the, when the guards were formed it was taken that guards would have no um uh, no political uh, ideas uh, and they weren't allowed to vote you know so but now uh, guards saw that they had the right to vote. They they saw that they had the right to to have better working conditions. Uh, you know, so in the in, in the in the second generation, you can kind of see it it, it kind of change. Uh, Tim Doyle, a great friend of mine and and a great writer, you know, of of his last book in particular, the the changing of the guard or get up them steps. The previous book, Tim came in. I asked Tim to write about. Um, Jim Marinan, who would have been one of the founders of the Garda Representative Association, and we talk about the Conroy Commission, we talk about the McCushla uh, ballroom affair, and again, Tim was talking to people who were there, people who were, who who were present, and and you know I know you know from back in the day if you were a guard and you're walking into a meeting and and there's a, a superior there taking your name, and and that you're going to be fired. You know, if 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 you attend, you can imagine the feelings. Uh, you know, in that room and and the the tension in that room. So, again, society is changing. So, Ungarda Khan is changing with society. You know, and and it's kind of it's changing from within, and and the members of Ungarda Khan see that there's a need for change. You know, their their pay isn't paying the bills anymore. Uh, they're not getting paid for doing overtime, but there's less numbers, so there's there's, there's more jobs to be done. So it's very warranted, you know, that there was there was a change, and you know the change did come. But it's it's thanks to the sacrifices again of the likes of of of, of uh, Marin and, and and the others that's kind of set the GRA up that 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 was achieved. Uh, kind of move on, and and the second generation, you also kind of have. Uh, I suppose policing the trouble. So, so after after the emergency, you know, there's kind of in Ireland there's, there's a there's a lull uh, there's a lull in relation to crime and in in relation to you know uh, major crime and and you know it's kind of some somebody kind of described it to me. It was it was kind of like a policeman's dream. There was there wasn't you know too much crime going on in certain parts of the country. But then we, we kind of get hit by the, with, with with the troubles and 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 what's happening up the north. This is when I kind of asked Sheila Brady, who is a former guard uh, guard sergeant, but she's also an expert and, and and a security consultant. I asked Sheila to kind of take an outside view and to kind of give us a view in relation to policing the troubles and and, and you know, uh, you know how we did it because we're a very unique police service when we talk about you know. A state security. A lot of other countries have have a separate uh, state security arm, but on Garda Shikana here, you know, we're policing the everyday, we're protecting uh, the public, but we're also, you know, over state security, and and particularly the times of the troubles, you know, that that security of the state goes goes way up. So Sheila kind of you know goes into a lot of uh, pieces in the piece in relation to the legislative response, the different acts that, that were brought out to, to, to assist on Garda Shikana in relation to their investigations. Uh, you know, she, she talks about the police and response uh, of it and, and, and the different practices that kind of came came in. Uh, and again, you know, she doesn't hold back and if, if, if there's instance when, when the guards, you know, we, we didn't uh, stand up in glory and there was mistakes made, you know, they are mentioned. A former chief superintendent, Paul Smith, uh, who I know a good while as well. Uh, again, Paul is, is, a, is a very fine writer uh, as well. And his last book, The Commissioner, did very well. I asked Paul to write a piece in relation to the burning of the British embassy because Paul was there and he was a sergeant uh, over a unit that was actually standing on the steps when, 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 you know, the petrol bombs were, were flying and he recounts kind of, he told me how his own pants kind of went on fire and, you know, going home to the wife and explaining this, you know, and, and it kind of, it, it, for me, it, it kind of, again, it's, it's, putting somebody in that situation and putting somebody in that place and putting somebody in a time in history that that will always be remembered in Ireland, the burning of the British Embassy, but kind of given the aspect or giving our reader a, a, an insight 
on a Garda's perspective and and how the Garda felt, how the Garda dealt with it, and 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 the kind of the the going ons that that, that kind of happened. So again, you know, I'm very happy that Paul agreed to do it, and you know, very happy that the, the piece was there. We kind of. You know, when we talk about uh, policing as well, there's very many different sides of policing in our job. So, you know, the guard who's who's in the middle of the country has a very different job than the guard that's in the middle of Dublin City. Uh, and, you know, I, I wouldn't say which one's better because I know, for example, if I'm working in the Dublin City at time and I need backup, that backup's there, you know, in, in a matter of moments. Well, if I'm working on my own, maybe in you know, 200 square mile uh, districts in the country, I, you know, I could be waiting hours and hours for backup. So policing in Ireland, even though we're a small state in different areas, is, is so completely different. That's why I asked uh, retired guard of Paddock Dunahoo to kind of come in and, and explain that to our readers in relation to a border beat and what it was like policing a, a border town during the Troubles. Because, you know, it, it, was, it was a different aspect of policing that when the troubles kind of started, that all of a sudden the Gardaí were, were, were thrown into into this air of, of uncertainty and and they had to learn very quickly and they had to learn very fast and learn very much on their feet. So that's why I asked kind of Pat to kind of bring that in, just his knowledge and his station and, and the different uh, aspects and the different events that, that kind of took place. And again, it's just because, and you're kind of getting a team here of the people who I invited in, a lot of them are writers in their, in their own right. And, and Pat Dunner, who, you know, produced a, a book, A Border Beat in 2021. And again, a fascinating read in relation to, to policing the border, uh, the foot of mouth diseases, Bill Clinton's visit, and different things like that. Uh, so again, it's 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 an important part, an important part of the history of the guards. Next chapter, I asked a good friend of mine, Edwin Hancock, who's a retired inspector. You know, we just wanted to have different areas of the guards, and, and Edwin does a, a very good chapter on the Technical Bureau and from the beginning, from the early days. And Edwin goes into uh, individual cases and cases that he was involved in. You know, so just highlighting that fact of I want people who live the stories to kind of write about the stories. Fucknell Donovan's next, and one of the big occasions uh, in Ireland was the visit of JFK. Uh, Fockner is a historian and a, a retired uh, sergeant who, who lives in the Barrow Peninsula, and you know gives a very good summary of of the near misses that that occurred during the JFK visit. The the very enthusiastic. Uh, you know, fans, followers, but the problems that enthusiastic fans cause for police when you're policing such a, such an event as JFK's visit. I was very, very happy to be able to publish finally a letter from uh, JFK tanking, uh, JFK to Commissioner Costigan at the time, tanking uh, the very professional work that Angarda Sri Khanna did during the visit. The story, the, the letter is very good because when the letter was originally sent and it's dated July 19, 1963, uh, a member of, of, of government would not allow the letter be published in the Garda Review uh, because it went against protocol and didn't mention somebody in particular uh, in it. And how could they be thanking people further down the ladder and not thank them. So unfortunately, the, the, the guards of the day didn't get to read it in the Garda Review. Uh, but many years later, thankfully, we were we were able to publish it. And it's, for me, it's one of the highlights of the book is, is having that letter published in the book. Uh, next chapter will be John Reynolds, uh, Sergeant John Reynolds. And John Reynolds is, again, a, a good friend of mine, and he was part of the editorial of the board. But John, historian in, in his own right, and he kind of became the face of the centenary celebrations for Angarda Shikana in 2022. His, his efforts he put into hosting uh, events up and down the country uh, were quite amazing. And, and I think everybody who kind of said that, for the centennial celebrations, they went so well, and it was because of of you know a lot had got to do with Sergeant John Reynolds. Uh, he's a great guy, and I asked John then to kind of write a piece in relation to the history of Garda headquarters and and the Garda College in, in Templemore. Uh, I could talk all night, but unfortunately, we, we we have an hour, and we probably need to kind of 
head into questions and answers. Uh, just kind of running through a few other chapters, you know, we, we kind of were coming into our modern policing. We're we're talking about Garda involvement in U United Nations, uh, United Nations uh, events ar 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 around the around the world, and how the guards kind of got involved. How a number of guards actually left the Garda Street kind of to join in the United Nations. Uh, and and again, another very good chapter. Another person who who headed up the Garda Museum, Martin Drew, kind of wrote about his own involvement in in Croatia, Kosovo, and 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 you know the the, the war in in, in the nineties. And again, it's a really good in depth personal story about somebody who had boots on the ground, you know, and who who was able to talk and discuss about it. Knowing Martin personally, he's again he's he's a great guy. He's a great historian. But even years after. After the war in in former Yugoslavia, Martin still holidays, you know, over in Croatia. Still has connections with people that 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 he met originally while working as part of the UN peacekeeping uh, mission. Uh, so again, it's that you know the aspect that I love. Somebody on the on the ground, boots in it, but he's still living through it today with the connections uh, that he has over there. I, I, another friend of mine, Aaron Martin, who's a a writer of the Garda Review magazine. Uh, I asked him to just to, to give us a insight into the history of the legal powers and the different, you know, acts that that kind of came in that really changed the face and and the workings of police work, you know. And 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 Darren's very in depth and, and he goes into a lot of kind of, you know, as society changed, how the laws change. And again, for any successful police service in the world, you know, the law as society changes, laws must change to, to have any progression, you know, uh, with policing. So so with that, we have a nice insight from our former assistant commissioner, Pat Leahy. Uh, Pat will probably kill me because I, I probably should have put Pat in the modern policing and not in the second generation. But a, a, again, when you're when you're formatting a book, it, you know, you kind of fit and you match and, and you change things. But Pat definitely isn't. I wouldn't consider Pat second generation. I would more consider him uh, modern policing as he's only retired in a number of years. And then I as we head into the third section of the book, then modern policing, you know, we're talking about uh certain i wanted to kind of grasp what it's like being a detective what it's like being an investigator what it means to a guard you know going through seeing what we see experience what we experience um you know keeping keeping what happens away from away from the general public and you know the general public at times does not need to see what we see or hear what we hear. Uh, so John Cribben, a, a friend of mine who was who was in chemistry, I asked him to write a piece in relation to a case very much uh, still in his heart, which is the Michael Bambridge murders. And he was so dedicated. His perseverance really shines through. Not only that, but John's a fantastic writer. Uh, it, it, it's a piece I really wanted to kind of stand out uh we, we have a reader's discretion on it because you know it's 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 dealing with topics that that aren't for everybody but i really thank john for writing it uh, I, I really think it adds to the book and again it's just showing you know the dedication that that members of, of, of the police service have to kind of conclude you know investigations successfully keeping that track uh i was very fortunate you know to be able to interview the likes of retired Assistant uh, Commissioner John O'Driscoll, uh, assist, retired Assistant Commissioner Tony Hickey, John O'Mahony, retired Detective uh, Inspectors Tony Stork, Mick Bourne, uh, in relation to investigator. I wanted to show uh, the public what goes into an investigation, you know, what, what teams work on it, how the teams communicate, how they work together. Uh, and I was so lucky to have, you know, all, all, all these guys who are real heavy hitters. And I think collectively, you know, I, I, I think we counted that collectively they had dealt with 3,000 cases and 3,000 you know, major cases. So, again, it's a fantastic insight in, into how investigations are conducted, you know, and how they're, how how uh, how the guards really kind of, you know, if if something happens, 
you investigate it quick. And if that means that you're working seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven days straight, you're working it, you know, and it's that dedication, you know, that many, many uh, members of Garda Shikana have uh, to their job. So then just a couple of things in relation to, you know, I asked people I know or interviewed people I know in relation to touching on kind of different sides of policing, like roads policing, uh, you know, with, with Damien Duffy, uh, tackling drugs and, and, you know, how drugs kind of came into our society and how, you know, all of a sudden there's a new crime to deal with and, you know, how how the guards kind of tried to deal with that crime. Uh, you know, obviously crime still exists and, and drugs crime is still one of the major uh, crimes that still exists. But Retired Assistant Commissioner Michael O'Sullivan, you know, goes through a lot of the detail in relation to, you know, his time, you know, working working on drugs, his time working, you know, as, as I suppose, as as soon as a couple of years ago. Uh, Michael was the executive director of the Rara Time uh, operations so still big into battling crime even after he left the Garda Street Corner. One of my favorite chapters, one of my favorite interviews that I did for the book was the, the story of Cab. Uh I call it a success story. You know, I was lucky enough to interview a former Minister for Justice Noreen uh oh sorry Nora Owen and a retired Garda Commissioner Faulkner Murphy. Thoroughly enjoyed interviewing interviewing them. Could see still the passion and the drive that they had for establishing uh, CAB. And again, we call CAB our success story because many many nations kind of came on and have copied what was done in Ireland to combat uh, organised crime at at that time. Uh, kind of getting towards the end of the book, one thing I, I was I was thoughtful about not kind of excluding was the idea of rural policing. So I asked the president of the GRA, Brendan O'Connor, who, again, who I know well, and I knew Brendan was a loud man. He'd worked in Dublin and then he had moved uh, family and all up to Donegal. So I wanted his take on the difference between rural policing and city policing, you know, and he gives a very good personal insight uh, into it. Like uh, for me, who always worked in the city, if I go home, it's very easy to take the uniform off and, and 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 continue with normal family life. But when you're then in the country and you finish your shift and you take the uniform off and you go down to the shop to buy your milk and your newspaper, everybody in that shop still knows you're a guard and that's not going to stop them asking you questions or calling up to your house on the Sunday looking for assistance. So, you know, so for the likes of rural policing, again, you're a police, you're a police man or you're a police woman 24-7. And Brendan writes a, I think, a very nice piece. Uh the super, the inspector, the sergeant and the guard is, is kind of a chapter. I just wanted to take, you know, four roles. I wanted to show the public what goes into the, their jobs in, in particular at, at any given time. And I just, you know, uh pulled together kind of four people from around the country that I knew, Chris Grogan, Ailish Miles, Derek Kenny and, and Billy Horn. You know, and again, it's just to give generally it was just to give the public a feel of, of the job. Calvin Courtney wrote a very good piece. He's 20 years working in the likes of Crime Call, Crime Line, you know, and we give the history in relation to the Garda Patrol. Again, one of my favorite pieces in the book, uh, you know, Calvin goes into into a lot of detail in relation to it. Uh Alan Cummins comes in and again writes about his passion. His passion is the dog unit, you know, talks about his dogs like Roxy, the training that goes into it, the connection that they have with the dogs and how the dogs are very much treated as part of the of the, of the Garda family. Uh, one of the strongest pieces, like akin to, to John Cribbins' piece, is retired Sergeant John Hines' piece on the House of Horrors. Uh, you know, it was so hard for John to write this piece, to to come up uh, with it, because, as he said, it really brought him back and it brought him back to to when he was investigating it. Uh, you know, fantastic piece. Uh, you know, he worked hand in hand with with our former colleague who, who passed, uh, Detective Garda Colin Horkin. And again, it's just for me, it's one of my favorite chapters in the book, you know, and, and again, it's about somebody who's there kind of later in the book we're talking about modern policing we're talking about diverse policing we're talking about the the, the startup of you know all of a sudden society is changing again and and the policing has to change to go with it, it 
policing our diverse communities, how we can have that connection with them, how we can build that community and that trust with them. Uh, also, kind of Su Superintendent Paul Franey wrote a very good piece about being gay in the job and about being gay in Gala Street, kind of what that was like uh, and what it's like today and, and, and how, you know, we've moved on and hopefully we'll continue to move on as society changes. Donald, I, I might have I might have overstayed my welcome. Thanks for that, Stephen. That was fantastic and uh, well done to, to to do that without without a, a slideshow presentation. That was just incredible. Uh, fair play, the passion you have for the book uh, really really came true. There were some questions that came in, uh, some familiar names actually. Uh, relations of of William Richard English Murphy, very important figure oh, for the guards. Uh, the closing down of Monto for one thing. And at the top of the street where I am, National Stadium, I'd say is one of his legacies okay. too. Uh, he came up a few times actually, with relatives tuned in from, from Yorkshire. But John said he established some of those teams of the guard of boxing to build morale and support from the community. Ah, so brilliant. Of the sport, the importance of us. Uh, Con asked, interested on the way you recognize the heroism of the first guards, a three uncles in the guards in 1922, one of them, James Woods was shot and killed in 1923 by presently researching him. Paddy Daly says, good webinar. You mentioned the guard is on duty 24-7, or they were in the 50s, 60s. Uh, was that a, a, a written rule or just a fact of the job in its own way? Yeah, with, with that, it was, it was just a, it was a fact. Before the, Con the Conroy Commission, there was no, like, there was set rest, but, you know, you were living in the station if you're a single man, and you could have been called upon at any stage to, to if there was a protest, you know, particularly around the start of the troubles, protests every day. Uh, so, so you were on call basically 24-7. Like today, you know, in relation to the Garda Code, we're still a guard 24-7 and, and, and it's our duty to carry our badge 24-7. Uh, Teresa says, uh, thank you to you and all your colleagues. Uh, is the role of a guard becoming more difficult and is it harder to recruit Gardaí now? Anecdotally, it does seem to be. I uh, yes, I I will I, I I will stay away from that one. Because... <laughs> as, as the Americans say, you're pleading the fifth. I I plead the fifth on that, uh, Trees, if you don't mind. But and, like, Patsy like, Murphy's like, question might be the same, asking around corruption in, in guard of forces historically, and if you think it was minimal. Yeah, yeah, partic particularly if you look on, on Garda Shikana in relation to other police services around the world, we have a very, very, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, and obviously in every orchard you have a few bad apples, and, and that does happen, I think, in every walk in life. But historically and today, we have minimal uh, corruption, you, you know, and with the oversight bodies, you know, today, if there is corruption, it, it is really you know, found out quite quick and and it's dealt with quite severely. So I, I, for me anyway, I think and I believe that we have one of the least corrupt police services in the world. Gonna uh, leave it with this question, which is a very good question from from Rosaline, who's a genealogist. She says, "I often use RIC records, uh, but are there similar records available, given kind of membership roles and the like, for Garda Shiakana, or will there be?" Well, if Rosaline goes on to the UCT uh, website, the original books that had the original members of the Civic Guards are up online. If you just Google UCD and, and kind of Google Civic Guard, uh, it, it will come up and that's all being digitized. Uh, kind of funny story in relation to that was if, if you look at the, the very first book at the very first line, Guard number one, some um, I think superintendent wrote his name in, in, in ink wanted it to be number one, but he couldn't be because it, it was only for the rank of guard. And then if you look at two, three, four or five, they've all been a little bit kind of changed just at the top. So we would consider the first guard to be PJ Kerrigan, but on the, the civil guard uh, registrar, he's down as one A. Brilliant. So, I just want to thank everyone for, for tuning in. Uh, the first night of the Festival of History, it runs right up to the 15th of October. As I said at the beginning, there are around 200 events happening online and in person right across the city of Dublin. Be sure to check out The Guardians, 100 Years of Vanguard of Shiakana. As we're saying at the, the, the beginning, uh, before we came on, I think that was one of the last books commissioned by 
by Michael O'Brien uh, in O'Brien Press. And it's just a beautiful, uh, stunningly illustrated publication. And I think many of you have tuned in, probably have it on your bookshelf already, but if, but if you don't, it'll be a very welcome addition. And thank you so much to, to Garda Stephen Moore. Tomorrow, actually, uh, the neighbours from Pierce Street, or they would say Tara Street, uh, Dublin Fire Brigade are on Zoom at the same time. But for now, with me and Margaret, thank you, Stephen. That's long folk. Thank you.